Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Here's your host, Sloan Patton. Well, welcome to this edition of Your Legislators. We're heading into the last few days of the 30-day legislative session. We're expecting a decision on the budget. It looks like it could happen sooner than last year. The minimum wage is being talked about and whether we might see it on a ballot this fall. And two resolutions dealing with webcasts are making progress. Those were introduced by Representative Jeff Steinborn, who's joining us today. Representative Steinborn, thanks for joining us. You got it. Good morning. Good, Good to be morning. with you. Good to be with you, too. Well, uh, I'd like to talk first about this resolution about uh, the webcasts. Uh, this was by you and, um, and Mary Kay Papin. Tell me a little bit about the two different resolutions. Sure. Uh, so I introduced two pieces of legislation to expand how uh, the legislature is broadcasting our meetings to the public. Um, several years ago, I introduced a rule change in the House to require that we start broadcasting all of our meetings uh, over the Internet so that the public could see what we were doing. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, these streams that we broadcast, and we, we were successful and we got it passed, and then the Senate followed suit. Uh, unfortunately, what we do not do is archive those meetings so that um, people can watch them whenever they want. You have to be watching real time. And I, I'm trying to help the legislature take the next step in, in this process and in this transparency. So I've introduced a bill to require that we archive all of the meetings that we broadcast, as well as our House floor sessions. And I've also introduced a separate bill to start broadcasting our, our meetings that we have throughout the rest of the year called interim committee meetings. And, uh, and those are meetings between the House and the Senate. And so it is a joint rule that I did sponsor with Senator Mary Kay Papin. And, uh, and both of these are really important so that the public can see exactly what goes on in these debates. Most of the work we do here is in the committee process. And uh, I think it's important for folks to understand how we come to the decisions we make, not only so they can learn about issues they care about, but also it's better accountability for their government. And better accountability produces, produces better government, I believe. So that's what those are about. Yeah, and it seems like those are, are getting some um, getting some motion that those those may uh, you know they look like they're going to pass. One of the other uh, resolutions I saw that you uh, introduced was House Joint Resolution Seven. That one's about um, amending the Constitution um, for selecting regents for the uh, Board of Regents. How did that come about, and you know what um, what exactly do you and uh, Tim Keller hope to change? Sure, and Sloan, just, just so we're clear, the, uh, the webcasting bills actually have a way to go. Okay. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm working as hard as I can to get them passed. Yep. But, uh, you know, like any big reform uh, proposal here in Santa Fe, usually takes several years to have happen, and uh, sometimes first met with resistance. So those bills have a way to go, and, and people that care about it should write their legislators and uh, let them know that they support that if they do. Um, your question about the proposal to reform our university regents. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've introduced a constitutional amendment, and I introduced this last year as well, uh, several constitutional amendments okay. to uh, change the way that our governor and the way that our state picks uh, what are called regents to run our universities. Right now, the governor gets to uh, appoint people who are basically the board of directors for each school, and they're called regents. Um, what we're trying to do is set up a nominating commission that uh, qualified good candidates would be vetted and that we would get a choose from amongst the best and brightest people with real passion for higher education, with ideas, something to bring to the table. And then these nominating commissions would advance these, the best of the best, to the governor for um, her selection as future regents. Right now, uh, there's no process in place, there's no qualifications, there's no requirements. And unfortunately, too often, our governors 
uh, pick people who have been good political supporters of theirs, hmm. but uh, may not have any experience in higher education. Um, and, and that's not to say that we still don't end up with some excellent regents, but that also means we sometimes end up with folks who really, uh, if compared against others who wanted to serve, may not be the best opportunity the state of New Mexico would have to run these higher education institutions. Hmm. So we're advancing this proposal to set up these nominating commissions. And um, this legislation has now passed two committees in the House okay. and is going on to the House floor tomorrow for full consideration of the House. So I'm excited about that. Uh, because it's a constitutional amendment, the way it works in the legislature is um, we have to pass this bill through both the House and the Senate. Right. It does not go on to the governor for her signature, but it would go to the voters of the state of New Mexico on the general election ballot this November. And then the entire state would get to decide if they wanted to set up uh, these bipartisan nominating commissions. And if they uh, voted to approve by a majority vote, then this we would basically change the Constitution of the state of New Mexico and this would become the law of the land. Mm -hmm. um, well, speaking of that November ballot, uh, one of the things that, that's being introduced again, you know, talking about putting it on the ballot for November is the minimum wage, a change yeah. in that. What sort of discussions have you been hearing among the uh, senators and representatives about the minimum wage? Sure. So lots of discussion uh, going on, uh, you know, kind of slowly grinding its way through the system a little bit. Uh, I know that in the Senate, uh, they just had an important vote to advance uh, this proposal for increasing the minimum wage. I certainly support it. Um, you know, the minimum wage, and you and I have talked about this last year, we the minimum wage was created by Franklin Delano Roosevelt many, many years ago to uh, basically set a floor level to help the working poor as a kind of a standard in our country that, that we would say that if you worked a full-time job, you wouldn't make below this amount. Over time, as inflation and as the cost of living goes up, you have to increase the minimum wage if, if you still hold to the principles of you know, what it serves and if you want people who are working to not have to rely on government services and be able to somewhat be able to provide for them and their families. So um, it's certainly you're not, no one, no one is under the assumption you're getting rich off the minimum wage because you're not, but it is basically a, a you know, it's a working uh, floor. So anyway, I support it. It hasn't been raised in some time and the value of it has gone down considerably and it's time to raise it and so I'll, I'll support it when it gets to me but right now it's still kind of slowly moving through the system. Right. Of course you're a Las Cruces resident, uh, second yeah. biggest city in, in the state and if this doesn't make any motion uh, you know, in, in Congress and doesn't end up on the ballot in November, do you think you'll plan to advocate for it once you're back in town you know, after the session's mm. over for the city to make any changes? Yeah, I would support the city adopting a minimum wage. Okay. Um, it, it's it increased. Albuquerque has done that in the past, and uh, uh, certainly the city of Santa Fe is one of the few cities in the country that has actually adopted what's called a living wage, which is a higher uh, wage standard. But, um, you know, we are the second biggest city in the state, and um, we have a lot to offer as a city to employers. And, uh, you know, when we talk about economic development, we want the right kind of economic development. We don't want to race to the bottom constantly. And unfortunately, New Mexico, um, maybe some folks think that's what we should have. And I, I don't think that always produces the best results for our citizens. So um, you know, we should have consultation over what that number is. Uh, but I, I would support Las Cruces uh, raising the wage if, if we uh, you know, can't get this done in Santa Fe for the whole state. Yeah. Well, uh, when the session uh, when the session started, Governor Martinez talked a lot about the budget. That was kind of her big thing that that she was pushing for. And in that budget, she had a 60% capital outlay uh, going towards water projects in southern mm -hmm. New Mexico uh, and throughout the state. How um, how has the budget changed, and and what what are the dynamics of uh, you know the Republican governor working with with Democrats mm -hmm. to to um, you know, fine-tune that budget. What's that? Mm -hmm. um, what's happened so far? 
You know, I have served under both a Democratic governor and a Republican governor. This is my sixth year in the legislature. I've been through probably uh, 10 legislative sessions. Uh, well, excuse me, uh, well, I guess six years. So this would be, uh, yeah, close to 10 sessions, including mm -hmm. special sessions. And uh, it feels very similar to what we've had under Republican governors. You know, the, the executive branch, the governor, is a co-equal but separate branch of government from the legislature. Right. And the governor gets a certain amount of funding authority um, given to her by the legislature, frankly. Um, she gets to appropriate a significant amount of money. She gets to try to advance legislation. And it's always a negotiation between a governor and the legislative branch over how much funding the governor will get to spend, over what those projects are. Um, I know Governor Richardson, uh, he believed he had you know, the best answers for how we should spend the money. And it's a common um, back and forth between the legislature and the governor. And it's really a negotiating process. And at the end, we come up with a compromise and we come up with a, a, an agreement and then we'll pass a budget. So, mm -hmm. so it, it's kind of similar to what all these sessions look like. And it's easy to get caught up in some of the skirmishes. But it's, it's really better to think about it as a negotiation that's going on. Uh, you had asked about water. Right. Uh, the governor did uh, make water a priority that she put out there that she wanted a, a lot of funding for. And I can tell you, we're still waiting to see list uh, from both her and some of the budget leaders. But, uh, but I understand that there is a significant amount of money for water projects around the state. We're fighting for Las Cruces to be, you know, have uh, some, some funding support in there. And, um, and I, I think hopefully we'll be seeing those lists here in the next few days. Mm, yeah. but, the, but there will be, you know, there will be funding, significant funding coming out of this legislation for water projects around the state. Yeah. Do you think this year there are going to be, um, you know, some concessions that Democrats are going to have to make that are any different than, than the years before? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think uh, the priorities change from year to year. No. Uh, but I know that um, I know that uh, a lot of the leaders of the Appropriations Committee, certainly the Speaker of the House, uh, the you know uh, the, Senate, the Senate leadership, uh, there's always a lot of concessions and compromise and uh, appreciation and respect for the prerogative of a governor to be able to advance part of their agenda. Um, and I see that happening this session as well. I, it's really, again, not about Democrat, Republican. It's about a, a, a co-equal branch of government and that we work together to pass a budget to kind of address everyone's priorities the best we can with the money that we have. And, and I see that happening this time. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, a governor or someone may point to one thing that they didn't get their way on. Mm -hmm. But in reality is when this all works when it's all plays out yeah. um, there will be a significant amount of money and uh, priorities of all sides that will have been accomplished and there will be plenty of stuff that people didn't get what they wanted and that's the nature of compromise right right absolutely so. well I'd like to talk for a little bit about something that I know is is near and dear to your heart and that's the film industry um, yeah especially in southern New Mexico I, I haven't um, I haven't seen any specific bills or anything like that, um, you know, just from, from taking a look. But, you know, what do you see as the future of film in southern New Mexico? I, we've talked about this before, but, you know, what, what are your thoughts now? Sure. You know, we, we have, uh, over the summer, I started a committee along with people from the university, other elected officials, uh, film industry, you know, professionals we have in Las Cruces, filmmakers like our Mark Vasconcelos and others. Um, uh, we, we wanted to look at our state and how, why is it that we have a robust film industry in northern New Mexico, but we really have very little uh, production going on in Las Cruces. Right. And what we found is that, uh, what we found is that um, one of the key things that you need to draw in the film industry is infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, being what's called a backlot, which is an outdoor film set. Right. or bigger production area called a sound stage, which is a big soundproof building. Uh, the other thing that you need is, is a trained film workforce. And of course, uh, we in Las Cruces do not have uh, that film infrastructure, a backlot or a sound stage, 
But we do have these incredible film programs. In fact, the Creative Media Institute at NMSU is considered maybe even the best in the state of New Mexico. Unfortunately, we're exporting these kids who want to work in the industry all over the rest of the country, Austin, LA, uh, Albuquerque, Santa Fe. Uh, so what we're doing is we're working to, um, to address those issues, to see how we might be able to bring infrastructure into Las Cruces, and then how we could ramp up our labor pool. And, and, I think, and, and then also, the city, of course, is about to hire a new film liaison. In right. the past, the city of Las Cruces has had a person kind of responsible for answering film inquiries. Uh, but what we're really trying to help encourage the city to step up that effort and put uh, a, a reasonable uh, budget behind this office so that we can really be aggressive in our marketing of Las Cruces to bring films in. Uh, we want to bring investment in for infrastructure. And of course, we all know that in southern New Mexico, we have incredible vistas. We have, of course, the incredible historic Mesilla Valley, Mesilla, um, you know, White Sands National Monument, the Spaceport, uh, the Gila National Forest, and of course we have our neighbor Chihuahua to the south of us. So we have an incredible diversity of uh, beautiful scenery and culture of which would be excellent for filmmakers. And yes, we do have direct flights to Los Angeles from El Paso. So we have a lot to work with. We just need to address some of these shortfalls. And I think we can begin to draw millions of dollars of film productions to our area. And, um, and what's so great about film is that when a big production comes in, about 70% of their budget gets spent in small businesses all across your community, from restaurants to hotels to uh, nurseries, hardware stores, and everything in between. So, so it would have a really great effect on small business in Doniana County. And, uh, we're really excited to be working on it, and I'm, you know, excited to help lead the effort. Mm -hmm. Do you think it'll take any legislation going, you know, looking ahead to the next session? Do you think that we'll uh, that you'll have to introduce bills to pay for any of those infrastructure needs? Yeah, you know that that, uh, that is certainly a possibility, and and uh, you know there's there's discussion happening now. So it's uh, certainly. Uh, there is a role for the public sector to play in, in helping with these things. And uh, you know, right now, of course, in the state of New Mexico, we have a $50 million a year uh, film incentive tax credit to help offset the cost of filmmaking when it comes in. So in the state of New Mexico, we already have a very strong role of the government helping to draw industry in and help offset their costs. And, uh, Certainly in some places around the country, like Austin, they're spending millions of dollars on infrastructure as well. And um, mm -hmm. we need to look at all these options in Las Cruces if we want to uh, develop this industry. Right. Well, um, another project that's, uh, that's happening in southern New Mexico, and this one you know, has captured everyone's attention for the last five years or so, is the spaceport. And mm -hmm. um, I, I know I'm, I'm looking at one bill specifically that Lee Cotter introduced. Uh, mm. Republican uh, senator from uh, from Southern New Mexico, uh, and it's it, it's talking about the the different financing options for the spaceport, uh, saying that you know he doesn't want it to uh, maintenance to come from the gross receipts tax. What are your thoughts on the spaceport? You know, first of all, just just what's your you know initial reaction opinion on on what's happened with it? Well. We all had hoped that the spaceport would be up and running by now. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, there are tests, there are things happening at the spaceport, but the big tent at Virgin Galactic, it's taking longer than projected to get their technology ready to where we can send people into space commercially. Right. They have made a heck of a lot of reservations. They've collected a lot of deposits. There's some very prominent people who are going to be coming to southern New Mexico when this thing becomes operational. We have uh, invested a lot as a state to build this facility, as has Doniana County. Right. We really have gone, I would say, 95% of the way there. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to stick with it and go the other 5%. We need to get a southern uh, road built through Doniana County. Mm -hmm. We, um, you know, the issue of financing is a really good one, and I, I which is Senator Cotter's bill, I, I believe yeah. that the state of New Mexico should, I don't think it should be on the backs of Doniana County residents to be funding the operations of the spaceport. Yeah. 
And, uh, and, and this is something that uh, I've talked to my colleagues about in the legislature. Um, you know, and yet they don't have that stopgap funding worked out, and they're relying on this support from Doniana County to help, you know, pay for the operations. Do we just uh, cut off the money and turn the lights off? I don't necessarily think that's the right answer either. Yeah. So we, we need to have us continue a very serious conversation about what we do. And what I'm trying to do as a member of the Tax and Revenue Committee and, and uh, you know, a mem uh, member of Doniana County legislative delegation right. is start to pressure the state of New Mexico that they need to be the ones starting to pay this bill until um, you know this becomes a revenue neutral proposition yeah. and uh, so there that's where we're at I think right now yeah. well we probably won't get a chance to talk again before this session ends um, here here in yeah. just about um, a week from when we're on the air but um, do you think that before the session's over, will the state of New Mexico pay anything for the spaceport, or do you think it'll still be on the backs, uh, back of Doniana County? Mm. You know, I'm concerned that um, I'm concerned that that they may not come up with a fix for that. Mm -hmm. But I also know that we're creating a lot of pressure, and Senator Cotter is helping with that to uh, to make it very clear that in Doniana County, we're not happy with being the ones to have to do this. Yeah. So uh, I hope we can find a resolution. I hope we can. But otherwise, I'll, I'll hope that, uh, you know, all the commercial opportunities for that spaceport start to come to fruition sooner than later so that it becomes a moot point. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, Sloan, but I know that I'm going to keep working for a solution. Yeah. Um, and then with the Southern Road, uh, is that something that you that you think Doniana County will will likely pay for, or need to pay for? No. Okay. No. So this this is a project that uh, that we're hoping will end up in the budget as a capital project, as a what we would call a statewide project, mm -hmm. uh, with support from the governor. Um, I think again, this is a statewide facility. Doniana County was actually promised a Southern Road a very long time ago and it didn't materialize. So I think this is another one of those commitments that the state of New Mexico has to uh, make good on. And, uh, and, and our governor has a very large amount of funding at her discretion that we as individual legislators do not. So this is a big project that's going to cost, I believe, $6 million uh, to get going on. And, um, and I've heard preliminarily that, that there may be money uh, in the capital bill, which again we have not seen for that. That's the same bill, by the way, that will contain these water projects. So uh, we're waiting with anticipation to see how that legislation looks uh, coming out of these budget discussions and with the governor. But I, you know, I urge the governor and the state appropriations leaders to include the money for that Southern Road. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, um, I'm taking a look now at uh, House Memorial 51. Uh, this uh, is an interesting memorial. Is this one that you've introduced in the past? I, um, it, it seems familiar, but I don't think that I've seen it uh, seen it up before. It's about uh, you know recycling municipal waste. Right. <clears throat> no, uh, I haven't introduced this one in the past. Okay, this uh, is first year. House mem okay. This uh, memorial that you brought up uh, would set up a new task force with the state of New Mexico, the state environment department, uh, the New Mexico Recycling Coalition that involves recyclers from all across the state from you know government recycling programs and companies that do recycling to look at what we we're doing as a state with recycling to see what else we could be doing to increase our recycling rate here in the state of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Right now in the state our recycling average is about 16 percent or what they call a diversion rate of about 16 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, some communities with curbside programs get that th their diversion rates up to you know 20 to 30 percent. A lot of rural communities don't have recycling programs or they have a drop-off center so obviously their recycling rate is very low as an average in the state where it's 16 percent. Well our state has a, a, what's called a solid waste act that governs municipal solid waste and it also has a recycling goal in that law of 50 five of 50 percent 50 for the state of New Mexico okay. obviously we're nowhere near that and uh, 
And in the recycling world, there's a lot of opportunities to, uh, to do more than curbside programs. Uh, there's unique programs where you can recycle TVs and carpet and batteries. And, and so, so that's what I think what this task force is seeking to do, is look at all these other ways, including you know, curbside and drop-off programs, to get more New Mexico recycling, more stuff. And uh, that's what this will do. And it passed the House Appropriations Committee, this memorial, a couple days ago. So now it will go on to the House floor and kind of one step away from being successful with that. Yep. Uh, well, I know we did a story uh, this past year on, on recycling in Donana County. And um, yeah. we found out that uh, one of the companies is out of Phoenix. And it, um, it you know, takes the recycled materials and then pays the, the county back for it. And I know that, that there were quite a few jobs created by um, just the sorting yeah. of the material. Um, do you think that, that we could, you know, by introducing this, could we see, you know, any kind of recycling center that's headquartered in, in New Mexico, mm -hmm. in our area, that, that would kind of keep the jobs within the state? Sure. Well, you know, I think you're talking about Freedmen uh, recycling. Right, right. And, uh, yeah, and, and I would welcome a New Mexico company forming. But what's great about Freedman is that they have, they have built up a company and they also provide recycling, curbside recycling for El Paso. Right. So what they have done is they have built up such an economy of scale by servicing all these different markets that they're able to um, get a better return from the people that ultimately they sell their goods to so that they can make a profit. And in recycling, you know, it's, it's uh, sometimes tough to make a profit. And so it's, uh, you know, Friedman's been a, a great solution for, uh, for us. Hmm. But, and, and, and I would say that they've created a lot of jobs in, uh, in Las Cruces. You know, we've got guys driving trucks, you know, sorting this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, they're, they're saving our cities from having to, um, you know, put this material in the landfill, which is expensive and has long-term effects. So, uh, you know, it's a good model to go, working with a private sector uh, partnership with, with governments to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it's a model that we can find, you know, some New Mexico entrepreneurs can follow to uh, bring to other parts of New Mexico. So it's, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. We'll see what happens with that one and the uh, other bills that are, uh, that are up. Uh, Representative Steinborn, thanks again for joining us. Oh, my pleasure always. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next episode.